Good morning and welcome to What is True. We're meeting, uh, this is brought to you by the Little Rock Church of Christ. We're meeting together in the Breckenridge Shopping Center. We'll be worshiping there together at uh, 10.30 this morning and then 5 o'clock this evening. We'll be glad to have you visit with us. We're maintaining our social distancing but continuing to assemble and worship together. I'm Don Patton and we're continuing our study of the fossil record. Normally on this program we're studying God's Word and that's what we enjoy doing. But we found that a great many people have been convinced by science that the Word of God is not dependable. I've been trained in science and I have found that science leads us toward God and toward faith in a Creator. And I really enjoy talking about the fossil record which I think is the critical evidence when we're talking about the creation evolution controversy. We began that in our last session. We're continuing now in the second session dealing with the fossil record. Uh, if I have an opportunity on college campuses, which I do from time to time, this, and I only have one subject, this is the one I prefer to talk about. And we've had a number of debates dealing with just the fossil record. We pointed out last time that the beginning of the fossil record is really the critical aspect. And when you look at what the evolutionists themselves tell us about the beginning of the fossil record, we see the creationist uh, with a big smile and the evolutionists have a headache, as they put it. As Maxwell Maltz of the University of Texas says, it appears things just burst out of a magic box. At the beginning, the lowest level is defined by the evolutionist of the fossil record. They're complex, suddenly, right at the start. Uh, Richard Dawkins tells us, a real headache for evolutionary biologists. Advanced, just planted there without any evolutionary history. We see all of the major anatomical designs, not the simple ones leading up to the more complex at the top, but right at the bottom, all the major anatomical designs, the chordata, that's the, the phylum with our group, the ones with backbone supposed to be the highest order, and all of its major divisions right at the beginning. And then to make it worse, since the Cambrian explosion, their description of this beginning, there have been no new phyla. Uh, now that doesn't look like the simple beginning with the uh, gradual progression upward. That's just exactly what would be predicted, especially if we're talking about the beginning of a flood deposit, which I think is a better explanation of what we see in the fossil record. These are statements by the evolutionist, not by the creationist, of the beginning of the most critical evidence. And yet, in the textbooks, this is the representation very different from what we find acknowledged to be the nature of the fossil record. In fact, if you turn this upside down, it would be closer. We had more kinds, more diverse uh, groups uh, in the beginning, and that has declined since then. And uh, <laughs> that's upside down as far as the picture of the fossil record. Where does this come from? Not from the fossils. It comes from the assumption based on similarities. And yes, we see similarities in the animal world. And here the pendactyl form of the vertebrate hand is demonstrated. The architecture is obviously similar. The evolutionist doesn't ask the question why, which scientists should do. They just assert this is because of common genetics. Another explanation is common designer. Similarities are often uh, seen, obviously, uh, with uh, architects that produce similar designs. It could be by common genetics, but as we compare the two explanations of this phenomenon, we see difficulty explaining this in terms of common genetics in view of the fact that it does not extend to the genetics. Uh, the director of the British Museum of Natural History, uh, Sir Gavin De Beer, acknowledged the attempt to find homologous genes. Now, homology is the, the similarity in architecture <coughs> that we see illustrated here. But homologous genes, no, it comes from different parts of the genes. This hand 
comes from here, this hand, they're not common genetics, which is a serious objection to the explanation of the similarity on the basis of common genetics. Similarity has a lot of, uh, <laughs> well, that's what they base their conclusions on, but there are a lot of fallacies involved. Uh, and a lot of information that's just not true. For example, <clears throat> we're often told that the chimpanzee and we share more than 99% of our genes. A quotation here from Richard Dawkins in The Blind Watchmaker, a book written 34 years ago. Uh, and it's a very outdated claim. It's just not true, but it's in the textbooks. Uh, it's uh, represented as uh, evidence for evolution. Uh, we look at more recent accounts of this from science. Uh, the official journal of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, as far back as 2007, uh, the heading refers to this idea of 1% difference as a myth and goes on to tell why the studies are showing that humans and chimps not as similar as many tend to believe, the very structure of the chromosomes confound any quantification of humanness versus chimpness. The, the structure of the chromosomes is such that you can't say 10%, 1%. It confounds any quantification. It's just so different it doesn't work that way. Uh, more recently in Nature, we're told the comparisons now reveals they differ radically in sequence structure, in gene content. And then in January 2010, chimpanzee genome is 10 to 15 percent longer. How does that fit with the idea they're only 1 percent different? Uh, it's just not so. Continuing, they say 50% of the human genes were missing from the chimp genes. Wait a minute, wait a minute. 99% similar, but 50% of the human genes missing? Somebody's not telling the truth. And if you hear that statement, you just know either they're ignorant or they're not being truthful. Continuing, they say one third more gene categories, entirely different classes of genes. And yet they continue to say there's only 1% difference. Well, it's just not so. But it illustrates that the numerous absurd fallacies involved in this argument from similarity, which they jump to because the fossils themselves do not present the kind of order sequence that they predict. It's boom, there it is to start with. So they go to similarities and mm, misrepresent the similarities. Uh, let me give you an illustration of the fallacy of the kind of argument that's typically made. Referring to the number of uh, chromosomes, we see a sequence like this represented, beginning with the penicillium, proceeding upward uh, to the housefly and to the bat and the human at the top. Okay, now that looks like an evolutionary sequence, a progression upward. We can see that, and of course that's the kind of thing predicted for the fossil record, which we don't see. But now look at the genes. It's uh, lined up and looks. The problem is that the facts are selected and arranged arbitrarily to deceive. Now that's a rather brash statement, but I can demonstrate that by looking at the rest of the picture. And we see the turkey's got almost twice as many chromosomes as the human. Human is down at the bottom of this arrangement with chimps ahead of us and the fern, the zenith of evolution at the top. Now, when you add the rest of the picture and you eliminate the arbitrary arrangement that's just to present a point of view, not what you find when you look at the facts, then you see the fallacy. It is deceitful. Now, if a lawyer is presenting evidence to try to prove a point in court and he leaves out significant facts intentionally, he's going to be disbarred. That is not, but that's what is done in science continually. 
in order to prop up this view of evolution. Another fallacy involves the fact that some similarities do not indicate kinship at all, even from the evolutionist perspective. We look at these two fish and they look similar, and if you agree, then I caught you, because neither of them are fish. One of them is a reptile, and one of them is a mammal. We're looking at the ichthyosaur and the dolphin. Uh, and so the, the point is they're not related, but they are similar, so similarity sometimes proves, they say, and sometimes doesn't. It indicates common ancestry, except when it doesn't, which means you're not proving anything. I think one of the most uh, obvious demonstrations of the fallacies involved in lining up similarities would be when we look at uh, the supposed relatives of man based on similarities. We're often referred to the blood serum with chimpanzees. Yes, you've got very obvious similarities here, and we look at the outward form of the human and chimpanzee, we would expect to see some inward similarities as well. If the right antiserum is used, you can actually utilize the chimpanzee blood serum. But that's not the case when you look at the rest of the factors. For example, we look at milk chemistry, <clears throat> and we're told that the closest relative there is the donkey, not the ape. <clears throat> the ape is quite different. In fact, uh, more recently, studying milk chemistry, there's some amazing <laughs> revelations. Uh, we have had the donkey uh, replaced with, for all of all things, the cockroach cockroach milk. Notice here from Science News, uh, 2018, got milk, roach milk could be a new superfood. Cockroach milk is among the most nutritious substances on earth, three times richer in calories than buffalo milk, the previous contender. Buffaloes <laughs> were in the lead. Now then, the, the cockroach, uh, the most protein calorie rich milk. Well, that's not quite the evolutionary picture, is it? We're all concerned about cholesterol nowadays, and uh, different animals have cholesterol. Guess where the closest relative is? The garter snake, not the chimpanzee. In terms of teeth, which are often very significant to the paleontologist, they're resistant to decay, uh, that's left, so they look at teeth, and sometimes that's uh, very significant when you're trying to distinguish human fossils. Uh, but what is the closest <laughs> uh, when we look at teeth? Well, it's the fish. That's not what people think, and it's not what the evolutionist would predict. You look at the sheep's head, wow, look at those teeth. <laughs> uh, there's some folks might look at that with envy. Uh, you look at the ape and, well, maybe some similarities, but not nearly <laughs> as similar as the sheephead. His teeth, wow, that's just, uh, <laughs> those are great teeth. Uh, furthermore, the parrotfish has teeth, been more similar than the ape. And so that similarity doesn't really fit the picture. Uh, when we look at foot structure, which is what we're concerned about when we look at the footprints down at Glen Rose, some people will say, well, maybe it's an ape footprint, and which doesn't help at all because apes and humans are supposed to have evolved about the same time, very different from the dinosaurs. Uh, but you look at the ape foot, <laughs> and it doesn't look like the human foot. Uh, the ape has a hand for a foot. But you do find things in the animal world that have feet like humans, very similar, for example, with the glacial bear. Now, he's a quadruped, he's got claws, but when you remove that factor, you see that without the claws, that skeletal structure is virtually identical to the human, not the ape, but to the bear. Uh, when we look at tear enzyme, very complex uh, enzyme, protein, uh, a tremendous uh, arrangement uh, of hundreds uh, of molecules, uh, very complex. Well, uh, we need the tear enzyme. 
uh, in our eyes. They're like little Pac-Man that go around eating the bacteria. The chicken needs it when he's making the egg, or she's making the egg, <laughs> and uh, whoa, they've got the lidosome, the tear enzyme, just like we do, unlike the ape. And of all things, you find it in a third place, <laughs> in the nematode. Uh, the human, uh, the chicken, the nematode have the same tear enzyme, or that's what we call it when you find it in our eyes. Blood antigen A, uh, very important factor when we're studying the heart. Uh, our closest relative is the butter bean. <laughs> and uh, now this, this you're gonna have a hard time believing. But we get to a brain hormone. Now this is a, obviously a very complex protein. Uh, who would have brain hormones like humans? Hold on, it's the cockroach again. Notice the statement from Discover magazine, don't squash that roach, he may be your cousin. It seems the roach and man have, not similar, but a, the same brain hormone. So when we look at similarities and look at all of the picture, not just the ones they select and line up according to their view, but you look at the whole picture, as was the case with the chromosomes, and you add the turkeys and the, the ferns, uh, you see the whole picture, and this is not what they would depict at all. What we're looking at is what we'll call a mosaic pattern. This is the kind of similarity that we talked about earlier uh, as the designer would use. He needs a blue tile here, and that's where you find it, and another blue tile is needed here, but it's not necessarily this nested sequence uh, branching pattern that would indicate evolution. And so we see similarities that are arbitrarily arranged, deceitfully, selectively demonstrated. And even <laughs> when they find similarities, that's not really proof. Many things are similar that are not kin according to them. If a lawyer behaved in this manner, he would be disbarred. So when we are analyzing the fossil record, look at the beginning the most critical part, it is abrupt, it is complex and diverse right from the beginning, as creationists would predict. No new phyla since then. When we look at these trees that you see in the biology textbook, it's in spite of the fossils, not because of them. They are selected similarities, arbitrarily arranged, not the fossils, not from embryology, in just very different from both, not from genetics. And when you look at the similarities, you see it's all over the place. It is a mosaic pattern, it's not a branching pattern. So when we look at the beginning of the fossil record, the most critical part, the trees, the similarity, this all favors the creationist view. It's no contest at either point the most critical part of the evidence is not in favor of evolution, it's in spite of it. We're sometimes referred to what's called transitional forms. This one led to this one, which led to this one. Uh, you see the lineup uh, in the textbooks and uh, that of course would be the kind of evidence needed by the evolutionist to substantiate the position. But do we find transitional forms, which is really the only way you could show evolution, isn't it? This one transitions to this one, transitions to that one. I'll notice what Darwin had to say about the problem in Origin of the Species. Many think that he was convinced by the fossil record and by transitional forms. He says innumerable transitional forms must have existed, but why do we not find them embedded in countless numbers in the crust of the earth. Not found, he doesn't know why. Now he will suggest it's because we need to do some more sampling, some more collecting, but it's not there. Why is not every geological formation and every stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain and this perhaps is the greatest objection which can be urged against my theory. 
this is not supportive of his view. It is the greatest objection that can be, and obviously it's, you ought to see progression. You ought to see transitional forms. No, you don't. Well, why not? Maybe we just hadn't found them yet, but that is an expression of faith, not found, uh, founded on evidence. Well, it's been 150 years or more since Darwin, and uh, we've found <laughs> millions of fossil species. Uh, surely we have filled in the gaps. We have seen the transitional forms. Well, let's see what the authorities have to say. Niles Eldridge is curator of the American, or one of the curators of the American Museum of Natural History, uh, one of the largest fossil museums in the world. Over 32 million fossil specimens documented there. I mean, that's, now then, we've got tons of evidence. If we find more, it'll help. He says he, Darwin, prophesied the future generations of paleontologists would fill in these gaps by diligent search. Now again, making predictions and seeing how it turns out is one of the ways to test the hypothesis. Okay, he predicted that you would fill in the gaps. What did this leading expert in the field tell us? Uh, it has become abundantly clear that the fossil record will not confirm this part of Darwin's predictions. It ain't so. In fact, he says the gaps got more obvious. Nor is the problem a miserably poor record, which some try to resort to. We just uh, can't possibly have a good record. That's not the case. The fossil record simply shows this prediction was wrong. Again, this is one of the ways you test a model. Make predictions, this works, this doesn't work, this is a poor model, this is a good model. This is scientific procedure and Darwin fell flat on his face in his prediction. We just sit here and smile and say, well, that's what we thought. Derek Eger, who at the time this was written, was president of the British Geological Association, writing in the proceedings, the Geological Association says, it must be significant that nearly all the evolutionary stories I learned as a student, now the stories would be this one led to that one, like the horse that he's referring to in the context, all, nearly all the evolutionary stories have now been debunked. Well, maybe you've seen the, the TV program Mythbusters, that's exactly what he's saying. They have been debunked. David Rapp is talking about that. Now, when, when we're trying to decide this, I can tell you what the facts are, but let's just let the evolutionist, uh, the leading experts in evolution, tell us. He is curator of the Chicago Field Museum. So here's the, the American Museum of Natural History. Here's Chicago Field Museum, the two largest fossil museums in the United States and among the largest in the world. Uh, Chicago Field Museum, probably the largest. Darwin was embarrassed by the fossil record because it didn't look the way he predicted it would. Now, embarrassment simply says the prediction didn't work. We are now about 120 years after Darwin. The knowledge of the fossil record has been greatly expanded. We now have a quarter of a million fossil species, but the situation hasn't changed much. Ironically, we have even fewer examples of evolutionary transition than we had in Darwin's time. Perhaps the two leading authorities in the world, uh, certainly close to that. And they're saying, you know, Darwin predicted this, and it was the biggest problem he had the greatest objection that can be urged against my theory. And it's gotten worse. It's a bigger problem now than it was then. By this, I mean some of the classic cases of Darwinian change, and he's talking here about the horse which we'll look at, such as the evolution of the horse in North America have had to be discarded or modified as the result of more detailed information. And of course, you all have heard that that's been discarded or modified <laughs> Probably not. Uh, fewer examples now. Well, the horse is the classic example of this evolutionary change. 
and we're not going to have time to look at all of that, but I'll introduce you to the problem. For one thing, we excavated this uh, huge donkey, Ascentius gigantus, out near Lubbock, Texas, nine feet tall at the shoulder. When you put a nine-foot donkey in the middle of this chart, it kind of messes up the progression, doesn't it? Looks like it's going the other way. The bottom representation is hydrocotherium. Uh, that was discovered by Richard Owen, first described. He's the one who discovered uh, or, or founded the British Museum of Natural History, which is probably the largest fossil museum in the world. Uh, and he used the word hydrocotherium, which means like a hydrax. And that's what it looked like. He's the one that first described it. And from a publication from the Natural History Museum, Oxford, uh, uh, England, it said that at, at the first horse was a hydrocotherium. Well, like a hydrax, that's the first horse. Well, maybe that looks like a horse to you. Maybe you've got a horse that looks like that. I don't know. I kind of think that's not looking much like a horse. Uh, Wikipedia says, no, it's the closest living relative of the elephant. Well, I am not sure that looks like an elephant either. I think what we have when we look at the horse story is uh, <laughs> an arranged sequence of similarities that are chosen in order to support the view. Uh, we'll look at a lot more evidence when we continue, Lord willing, in our next session. We're glad you tuned in with us this morning. We want to look at the facts. What do the facts indicate? Uh, I think it's very encouraging and embarrassing to the evolutionist. Thank you for tuning in.